Hello and welcome. I'm Claudia Rizzini and I'm the Executive Director of the Rackley Fellowship Program at Harvard University. Today's presentation is by our Robert G. James Scholar Fellow, Homera Kaderi. Homera was five years old when she saw her city, Herat, through the viewport of a Russian tank. She was nine years old when the civil war began and 13 years old when the Taliban seized control of the Afghan government. It was during this time of incessant war that Homera discovered the power of writing. In spite of the Soviet Union's invasion and his eight years of service in the military fighting against Soviet forces, her father would read Russian literature. In these moments, Homera learned the power of the written word which has the potential to transcend politics and deep divides. In books, she found the possibility to imagine cities beyond her own, offering her, windows, her a window to the wider world. Homera first turned to writing as a means of survival. However, it soon became a vehicle to tell the stories of her past and speak for those whose voices had been silenced by decades of war and written off by political as political collateral damage. In her most recently published memoir, Dancing in the Mosque, she details the story of her life through a series of bravely honest letters to her son, who was taken from her when he was just 19 months old. The memoir is filled with both heartbreak and subversive, subversive joy depoliticizing the wars in Afghanistan to foreground the everyday stories of people who are directly impacted by military invasion and social upheaval. She's also the author of six other works of fiction and nonfiction in Persian literature, and also has, has also written several books for children. During her time at Radcliffe, Homera is working on her forthcoming novel, Tell Me Everything, a work of fiction that centers the personal over the political. It tells the story of a young girl who, having been, kidna having been kidnapped by Russian forces during the Soviet-Afghan war, returns to her hometown only to find, to find it is under Taliban rule. This novel, largely inspired by Homera's experiences, chronicles over 30 years of political turmoil to bring greater awareness to the complex history of Afghanistan. She hopes that with a more nuanced understanding, we can advocate for effective and long-lasting change in Afghanistan so that she can return to the life she built for her son and herself in the country she loves. I am thrilled to welcome Homera Kaderi to the podium. Thank you so much, Kilidia, for your kind introduction. And thank you so much for all of you to being here today and also for audience through the Zoom. Um, last year when I had a talk, uh, I, hi, Asil, I am happy to see you here. <laughs> you was not here yesterday. And when, last year when I had a talk, um, I just write the things that I wanted to say and my translator translated and I read it. So when I read it, actually, I didn't understand what I am saying. So I decided to, for this year, I speak, even with a lot of mistakes, so at least I understand what I am saying. I can choose the word that I want. <laughs> so maybe because I know what I want to say and I understand what I am saying, maybe I cried, so don't worry. So. Tell me everything. Okay, for me, um, um, interesting to um, a story writing or a storytelling goes back to the, when the Russian um, invaded Afghanistan, Soviet Union. When the bombing started at that time, I remember my mom um, took me by my hand and went to the basement and I started to telling me a story, just because make me calm. For me, um, one of those stories was very, very important. Um, it was about, um, 
It was about Bozak Qandi. Bozak Qandi's story is about a goat. A mother goat going to uh, was um, a mother goat goes to graze in the one morning, and when she comes back, she finds out that a wolf uh, attacked to her children, baby goat, and take them away. So uh, mother goats go for a fight with the wolf and meet her fight with uh, meet him fight with him, and at the final snapped uh, its belly and took away her children. This story gave me very, very, very comfortable because I knew at that time if any soldier, Russian soldier uh, wanted to stab me or wanted to take me, my mother will be there to take me out from his belly. And actually, it was true because after 30 years, when the White Wolf Taliban attacked Afghanistan in 2001, while I was a single woman in Afghanistan, and it's a taboo, and I was living with my only a small child in my house, my father and my mother, while there wasn't any flight in Afghanistan in those days, driving near to 13 hours from my city, Hamtan, Herat, to Kabul to be with me. And it was, you know, one part of that real story that's happened in my life during all this war time. But um, Suet, uh, Suet in, um, in vision, Suet uh, in vision Afghanistan take place around one decade, and after they left Afghanistan, actually we didn't have anything. Everything was ruined, and, but don't worry, it, was, uh, it had a happy ending. This is me and my son, Siawash, just two or three months before the Taliban attack Afghanistan in 2021. I should to say because the Taliban, I should remain to always that uh, history because the Taliban attacked Afghanistan two times. So I know uh, we won after the, um, this tank is uh, belong to the Russians. And it's just a souvenir picture, but I, I believe uh, no one uh, wins in the war because all of us lost our homes or uh, loved one. Okay, after, um, of course, after um, Soviet uh, invasion that took, um, took last, um, near to one decade, uh, we had a civil war for near four uh, years. And after that, Taliban came to Afghanistan. So with the Taliban came to Afghanistan, I remember my father was a mujahid and, uh, during the fighting with the Soviet invasion. And um, she fought against him for near seven, eight years. But with the starting of civil war in Afghanistan, my father put gone, his gun away, and he didn't want to be in the dad's parties because all of them were Afghan. But he had very, very bad memories from fighting with, against the um, Soviets. He started to read uh, a story. As much as my father suffered from... Um, Against uh, fighting against the uh, Russian, he was get confirmed reading literature of Russian, and it was surprise for me. When the Taliban attack Afghanistan, and the situation of Afghanistan for women get worse by the day, I feel that the only way that I can to be comfort or calm or keep my sanity is to start in reading a story. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for me. Nor my mother's story and not my father's books keep me calm. And I understand that finally for me, writing is more helping during this situation. My first story was about the dandelion. The dandelion in my story could go everywhere, and I asked her to go to God to help me in this situation. 
I understood during to writing process, I can do everything that I want. I can make my home uh, without wall. That was very good, because we have a house in Afghanistan with very tall walls. I could go to my school and my stories and see my friends, see my teachers, and laugh as loud as I wanted without fearing of Taliban. And they just happen in my story, not beyond of that. Interesting um, to writing drove me and some of my friends to make uh, ground classes, underground classes, as we named it, um, the Swing Circle of Herat. We supposed to swing in that class, but we write in that class. We were four. And writing also, in those times, it, wa it wasn't a way for sa saving all of the girls. Lida, the girls who were black in this picture, she was uh, very my uh, close friend. But because of the situation in Afghanistan gets worse, for, especially for women, self-emulation was a common process between the girls to save them from the life. Lida also did self-emulate in those time, and I lost her. Before we started our class, this is the class uh, that we had, the, the door. And as you see there, you can see that we wrote in Farsi, the golden needle swing class. And many years later, Christina Lam, a well-known famous journalist from England, wrote this book, wrote this book that is translated to many languages, and it was a big part of that book was about the, this class. We were four girls, and the only who survived for writing, it's me, that I'm here now. And I lost others' friends. OK. In 1999, before the US invaded Afghanistan, I could publish my first story in the Taliban time. And it was published with the empty hand, the name of the um, story in 1995, September of 1999. It was published in the only uh, newspaper, major newspaper in my city. And after it was published under my name, you can see here Humaira Qadiri, a short story by Humaira Qadiri. Taliban treated the family by lashing because the name was forbidden, name of a woman, even on the paper was forbidden. I remember my father went to the bazaar, and he and my brother tried to pick as they can this newspaper. So it was the, my father knew that the only way that I can keep my sanity was to writing and reading. He was a supportive, but the Taliban, living in the, under the yoke of Taliban, wasn't easy. I never blame him for that action. On 2021, um, August 29, 2021, when I wanted to came to the USA by um, passing the secret gate, as you know, the, norm of, the name of the book, The Secret Gate, the deep American diplomat who wanted to save me snatched my shoulder bag, which my laptop was in it, and told me that you are not allowed to take your laptop with yourself. Because the one day before, we had a very big implosion in the air gate, uh, in airport in Afghanistan. And as you know, 13 soldiers of the USA and more than 200 people of Afghanistan was killed in that suicide attack. So they escaped from everything. And I told him, he had this mention to save me, and I told him that I don't want to save only me and my son. I want to save my stories. And all of my story was in that laptop. And I told him, if you don't allow me to take my laptop, I will return to home. 
You can see all that picture on that scene in this book. This book was, has been released on <coughs> April 25 and was written by Mitchell Zukov. It's not my book. But what was in that laptop that was very important for me, and I wanted to save the laptop also with me and myself, tell me everything, is the, my new book. I started this book after I had a contract and edit uh, with the publisher, Harper Collins, uh, with my books, Dancing in the Mask. Okay, and when the Taliban in 1996 conquered Afghanistan, I was really a teenager near my beginning of 12. And the situation in Afghanistan for women, as you know, like right now was. The school was closed, the woman couldn't go out of the home without a male guardian and, or mahram. And uh, even the women who were patients, they couldn't see male uh, doctor. So I remember one day, a very young uh, woman, maybe 18, 19, came to our house. Why? She was wrapped on the bandage till her wrist. And she was uh, very sad, I remember. And she came to our house to my, just to my uncle treat her. My uncle in that picture at that time was a very young doctor, but very famous for her, his uh, field. The, doc the girls spoke with me a lot. And she told me that when she was a very a young kid, maybe four or five, she was kidnapped with other children from my hometown. I don't remember, and the people don't speak about that even now. They were kidnapped with others. She was kidnapped with others to Soviet Union to taught the communist ideology and return back to Afghanistan equipped with the communist ideology as a local enemy for the country. I feel regret why I didn't, didn't ask her more questions at that time, because I think I didn't understand the meaning of what she is trying to say to me. When she returned to Afghanistan, um, she faced with the situation and a Taliban at the end, because she couldn't tolerate that situation. And when she returned, her brother tore up all her uh, documents, passport, and everything that he had from that country, she couldn't return to Russia. And as you know, the woman even couldn't go out of the home without male guardian. So she is stuck in her heart, and she couldn't tolerate the situation. She threw herself in the will. She survived, but she broke her back. The story stuck in my mind. And Many years later, in a very famous page of Facebook, I saw these two pictures, these two brothers, these two missing brothers. I don't know from which city they didn't mention. They, take, uh, they asked for help to find their family. They wrote that they were kidnapped in during of Russian invasion to Afghanistan, and they sent to the um, Soviet Union, but after the collapse, um, finally, they, I don't know how, they end up in Spanish, and they lived there for 30 years. But they started, after the Facebook and everything and internet began to work in Afghanistan, they started to search for their family. It took just one week. To the, I saw again in that page in Facebook that they wrote they found their mothers, but their father was died in during days, uh, years, but they found their mothers. It's click again the story of Roshana in my mind. So I think you have seen or you have heard about this girl, Aisha. Aisha was punished because of her uh, wasn't enough uh, behavior. Her um, husband was punished by his, her husband. And her husband beat him in the desert cut her nose and also her ears, and left, left her, her in the desert to die. But 
the soldier of Afghanistan and the soldier or of one soldier of Afghanistan or two soldiers of the United States found these girls and they take them to their base in Bagram. And after that, they send it her to the Kabul shelter. And finally, she ended up in the Canada and she had some surgery. Again, she came to, I don't know why, she always came through the story of Roshana in my mind. And when I finished this book, Dancing in the Mosque, with this title that's barely near to um, stone me in Afghanistan by very radical groups, I thought that it's time, I was pondered that it's time to telling the Rukhshan, story of Rukhshan after my book also went for many translations in other language. I was writing Tell Me Everything, and that laptop was my story, Tell Me Everything, a story of Rukhshana, combined with the story of Daesh. And when I wanted to come out of the Afghanistan, actually I was finished. I finished the first version of the Tell Me Everything. And I couldn't allow to the diplomats, American diplomats, to take my laptop and put it in, uh, it's, it, they put it in the street and they wasn't care about that. So after the Taliban take Afghanistan again in 2020, 2021, and I turned as an immigrant, and I turned to just to a number, I brought with myself this story here. I was in Texas, and um, I was uh, for one day in airport um, in Kabul. It wasn't the airport that I knew it. I knew it before. It, I went from the airport of Kabul to many countries, but that night, it wasn't my country. Even the airport, it wasn't my country. Um, I was 60 days in Texas in a big camp uh, with a, in a big tent, uh, like here with the maybe more than 100 people for 60 days, and after I landed here in um, Harvard. But in, um, I, excuse me, when I was here, I had 60 days to finish Tell Me Everything, or maybe I wanted to read it again. And I sent the first draft of Tell Me Everything to my agent from the this camp in Texas. Okay, the story of Tell Me Everything, as you know, a story of one girls. But what will happen during all this situation in Afghanistan to the storytellers? In this book that I was published in not one of my nonfiction books, I have seven fiction book and two non-fiction non book. All these two non-fiction non book is about the history of history in Afghanistan. I, it, this book is, um, was published in 2015. I mentioned how repeatedly war forced our writers, poets, and other activists to come out of Afghanistan and in the, to come out of Afghanistan here. As you know, um, sorry, here this woman is Spujme Zerya. She is very well known, um, short um, story writer. And she left Afghanistan after the Soviet Union invaded. And she ended up in the France, and she never wrote after that. Uh, her husband, um, Rahnavard Zerya, she, he also was in France, and um, she was, he was there for two decades, and he never wrote, but when he returned to Afghanistan, he could write four or five books, and we lost him in, during the COVID times. Akram Usman, the third person also, he left Afghanistan after the civil war. He went, ended up in Sweden, and we never had any book of him after that. He is very famous in Afghanistan in his, his time. And I know, I, I think seven or eight years before, uh, he wrote a book and he published it in Afghanistan, but because he had a 13 years that he never write any books, people or new generation even wasn't familiar with him. 
They were the lucky people, but look at the last person, Qahar Yossi, is a very famous, he was a very famous poet in Afghanistan. He had more than 10 collection of poem, but finally he was killed, and he didn't have that opportunity to came out of Afghanistan. He was killed by a mortar in the during of civil war in Afghanistan. Um, I, uh, I show in the book and also now that we had four uh, uh, times that we had be a immigrant and be um, to others' country. The first uh, wave of immigration started in, in 1980 till 1990 to Afghanistan, and we had lost a lot of people in during times. With them, our activists and activists also. The second one is the time in 90 to 96, the civil war time. And 1996, 2021, the time the Taliban attacked Afghanistan. And also, I remember many of my friends uh, um, they uh, killed themselves or they were as uh, immigration. And between all these groups, we had a lot of uh, activists and artists. So and the last, uh, from 2001, the immigration in Afghanistan like, somehow stopped and the people was hopeful to can uh, continue their life and they stayed in Afghanistan. But again, in 2021, until present, we have many people especially our artists and artists that left Afghanistan. You know Mohsen Mahbal uh, He is one of our fellow in this year. Um, I remember uh, um, one morning, and I think it was um, September, uh, August 23rd, that I was informed in the morning that more than 400 of poets, writers, actors in cinema and theater, painters, uh, they um, was evacuated to France in the night, in one night. And I, I remember when I awake and I was in for, I feel lonely in my country. And Mohsen Mahmal Bhav was one of our fellow who very, very helped to the, these more than 400 people, if he is right now. And listen to me, I thanked him. Um, but I wanted to say a little bit about tell me everything. Um, yeah, tell me everything. I narrated this uh, book in three parts. The first part, I show, um, the, let's the, um, name the girl Rokhshane. Rokhshane um, was uh, in an imminent threat to be killed by his uncle. It's a fiction, I changed some things, as you know, it's happened in fiction. Um, and, uh, but when, um, before he was getting killed, some people um, uh, helped her and um, he, um, some people know, Afghan and American soldier helped her and they bring him, brought him to their base and after that they sent him to the Kabul to a shelter. And in these times, she should wait in shelter for four months till uh, she could take her visa to the US. In these five times, with the very extensive flashback, I show how Roshana was kidnapped and why his, uh, her uncle wanted to kill her because her mother was raped with one of the soldiers, and Roshana actually is a product of the rape of uh, Russian soldiers. Another story that we never speak about it in Afghanistan. We is for us, especially for our men, is easily to speak about the war, about how many people were killed, how many uh, home was destroyed, but we never speak about how many women was uh, or were raped, raped by the soldier of the Soviet Union. So, um, in the, this a big extensive flashback, I say all of them, and after that, we return again in the shelter, and from them, we, all, we have a journey with uh, Rokhshana to the USA, and from that part, again, Rokhshana faced with another problem. Um, she felt a profound sense of confusion and lost identity. I don't bring a very a stereotypical ending for the book to Rokhshana fall in love here and buy a house and give her mortgage every month and finish. 
No, the book uh, show how Rukhshana want to navigate her circumstances in a country here like the USA, while she is trying to find her connection again with her folks uh, in the big mansion of Arbab house, Qal'ay Arbabi, the place he lived before her um, um, uncle wanted to kill her. So now I wanted to read one part uh, in Farsi. I know you cannot uh, understand the meaning, but I put some paper there. You can see the papers. I made it here a little more short. Just I want you to listen to the voice of Farsi. And uh, I hope you enjoy. Rusa Qazal Raham, Darun Jeep Kishidant. جیب حرکت کرد از جیب رفته قباری در آسمان ماند و خط سرخ خونی بر زمین دشت را دویدیم پشت سر پدر و قزال صدای پدر خاموش شده بود و تمانده های جیغ های قزال هم دیگر به گوش نمی آمد سایر تا شام خط خون را دنبال کرد تاریکی که رسید رد خون گم شد سایر برگشت کنار دروازه خانه آنقدر نشست تا شغالهای فربه ده به چق چق افتادند آن شب برای بار اول سایر بعد از چهل سال در شادخ احساس بی کسی کرد دختر کوچی تنها مانده بود دلتنگ ایل و تبار میخواست برود کجا؟ معلوم نبود جایی که دیوار نباشد جنگ نباشد دمدم های صبح در گرگمیش هوا خشخشی شنیدیم صدای کشیدن گام های خسته بر روی زمین جنی، انسی در دل تاریکی جسه کوچکی دیدیم که به سختی رو به جلو می آمد بدو از خانه رکابی آوردم زیر نور لرزان قزال را دیدم خودش بود اما نه خودش نصفی از خودش مانند پارچه نخی آب رفته بود سایر قزال را در بغل فشرد و من چشمم به کشاله گوشت پشت سر خواهرکم افتاد پدر را آوردم قزال گفت قزال با چوب و سنگ روزها به وقت دلشان قزال را هم از جیب پایین انداخته بودن قزال در مسیر برگشت باقی مانده بدن ارباب شرف را هم با خودش آورد اما در گذر از در شغال بوی خون را حس کرده بود قزال با چوب و سنگ به جان شغال افتاده بود و در نهایت برای من تکه های از پدر را به خانه آورد بعد از آن هر شب هر از گاهی که آواز شغال به, آواز شغال به گوش قزال می رسد دخترک از دست می رود بین مردم ده شایع شد که شبی از شغال که شبی شغال ها شبی که شغال ها به زوزه بیفتند قزال نیز تبدیل به شغال می شود بعد از جنگ دروازه خانه را هیچ طلبکاری برای آخرین دختر خانه نزد اوکی آی وونت شو یو ا لات اف پیپل سی تو می واتس هاپن واتس هاپن ناو فور افغانستان اند وات واز دی سیچویشن بیفور I'm an artist, I'm trying to show it through my books, but now it's hard to bring all the book for you, but I wanted to show it through a video. Uh, I wanted to give a warning here that this video that I'm showing about next um, has some sense of physical abuse. Um, this um, video has, is not more than once, uh, one minute or two minutes, um, and has four parts. One part is one wedding in a village before the Taliban attack Afghanistan in 2021. The second one is show two girls while they are going to a school, they are dancing. And again, we are, will see two girls or many of them while the Taliban close their school. And the last one is happened uh, maybe 10 days ago in Afghanistan and you will see what happened to the woman.
At the end, I want to say, I am, uh, when I wrote my book, a nonfiction book, about the, what's the impact of war on the storytellers and storing, I never knew that. I will be one of that uh, immigrants uh, storyteller soon. I am belong to the fourth immigration period of time uh, that uh, I landed in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Homera, and we're glad to have you here. Thank you. For all the wrong reasons, I suppose. Um, questions. Are there women in Afghanistan who are reading your books, and do you think literature can make significant change? Uh, good question. You know, if we work on culture, if we work on art, I am sure, as the uh, other country changed their culture uh, by art, writing, Afghanistan also can change everything by um, art. I remember uh, four or five months ago, I sent one of my um, articles to a very famous um, newspaper in Los Angeles and asked them, I wrote about how we can bring change to society through the art, in a, through the art. Uh, but you know, uh, the answer was, do you think um, Afghanistan and situation for women also changed through the art? Really people understand anything about the art? And I don't know, they, the chief editor write, write, wrote to me, and um, I wanted to say, if we believe in art, yes, I'm sure. Like others country, Afghanistan also will change with art. But it's important that, are you believe in the people of Afghanistan or not? Mm -hmm. So even before you came here to the United States, uh, you published Dancing in the Mosque in Afghanistan, correct? Yes. yes. So uh, what do you, uh, you know, you had a, a kind of a, a story, a life story, that's somewhat similar and somewhat different from the life story of your of your um, people living in the country, in your country. How do you see your ability to rise above and live kind of a different life, the life of an author and an artist, an activist in your country? Um, um, maybe I couldn't get you. So, even before, you know, even with all the issues that you have described the country and we know that it had, you know, the Russian war, the <coughs> civil war, etc. You were able to publish in your country, and so you kind of rose above, like the average woman in Afghanistan. How do you think that was possible for you? So I had always support of the family. Uh, mm -hmm. My father and my mother were my supporter during my life. But I wanted to say that society of Afghanistan wasn't very bad. Uh, the only problem. Um, was that we had experience of 40 years war in Afghanistan and it's not easy to be in the war and be also in the path of progress. We always stuck in the situation. We always just raise our young um, generation for fighting with others. Uh, my mother never go out of Afghanistan, but she saw in my country, the Soviet Union, um, the, the radicalism people that they imported from other countries to Afghanistan. And even my f mother saw the soldier of the U United States. We, so we always was in the situation to defend ourselves. So how we could think always about the progress. But before the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, uh, we had university. And my mother, um, I had to wear burgay when I was a teenager in Afghanistan. By when my mother were a teen, was a teenager, he were he wore many in Afghanistan. So we came from a very very light 
pass, but the situation get worse by the day in this during 40 year of war. So I wanted to say, a progress has a history in Afghanistan, and the people love this progress. But the situation and the, that proximity war always stuck us in the bad situation. Mm -hmm. So, following on on your life journey, so you left Afghanistan, you're now in the United States. Um, what were the biggest challenges and uh, that you faced uh, here in the country, in in, in the U.S. In making a new life and you know, kind of embracing a new culture. Um, maybe for others, other people came here and lost their house is not easy. Also, it's not easy for me. I always had to leave um, the house that it was full of the picture of our family. With every losing, even I lose that picture, and sometimes I'm thinking that I have even a picture from with my grandfather. Um, a person who has a very big role in, the, my, in my book, I don't have because always we lost the homes during the war. Uh, I saw how many times my mother lost her house. I saw how many times my grandmother lost her house. It's a pain that I think has a cure because I can make the house, I can make that wall right now. And I did it here in Boston. But the only thing, things that I'm Really, it's really a pain for me that I think I cannot face with it. Is when I'm losing the reader in every society or community in Iran, in Afghanistan, in India, or Tajik, Tajikistan. When I make community, I lost them, especially in Farsi. Uh, after all these years, I had a group that they people love to read my books, and right now I am in a situation that. Uh, again, miss, like the other um, writer, have you seen them? I show you that. I, again, it's come like a bar. The language come barrier for me. It's a hard to express myself in um, a language that I'm not familiar or I don't have any root with it. It's very hard when I'm reading something that I wrote, but I don't know it. So the only pain that I always think is very fresh when I am experiencing is the losing the reader. Mm. Um, how do you see, well, let, let's get to the second part. How or what, to what extent do you stay in touch with uh, your family and your community in Afghanistan? Do you actually stay in touch with them? Can you do that? Um, yes, I, I'm always in touch with the family. You know, the people living in Afghanistan is uh, um, like folks together. And so when we are saying about cousin, it's not like really they are another family, they are like sister. We are all living together, married together. And it's, um, our children living together. Um, so I'm not just in touch with the family, I'm also in touch with the, my uh, students. Mm. As I show you the, that the golden needle sewing circle, I uh, registered that uh, name here in Boston, and I'm teaching many girls and boys in Afghanistan creative writing. I have more than right now 300 people in my classes, and I am in touch with them. I think um, the only, uh, I, I got you know, a lot of uh, energy when I am with them, and, but I see how much they are dispirited now, how it's painful for them to uh, be in the situation when the Taliban is a, like a ruler for them. Especially this new generation, for me, maybe living with Taliban be more easy because I had the experience five years live with the Taliban under the Burqa. But this new generation, they even don't remember anything about the Taliban. They are around 18, 20. They was born in the democracy time in Afghanistan. And even they didn't read any book about the Taliban because we don't write a lot. We don't have a lot of writers. So I am in touch with all of that people and I'm seeing, it's like I'm monitoring my country far from and the pain is the same, no different. Even now, because I know more, I am suffering more. Hmm. So um, talking about the, uh, Moving on to the political situation and the situation specifically in, with regard to women. 
How do you see the current, sit the current political situation in Afghanistan? What, can you tell us what you are thinking as you see what happened and who is in power right now? I'm not surprised with the Taliban at all. They had their idea, they had their identity. They are fighting for that. They killed themselves because of their idea. They are really, a, I don't want to say a strong group, but they are really a believer. They are believed to the say what they say. But the only thing that I'm surprised with it is the war. Because I, maybe three years before, I never thought maybe we have a country in the world, even Afghanistan, that the girls cannot go to a school just because they are girls. We, 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 we can not go to a school because of earthquake or any other problem or like a quit. All of us can sit in the house. But how is possible? I'm from Afghanistan, and I was in the situation that I was not allowed to go to school just because I was a girl for five years. But how is possible now why the world is silent? I, I, I'm not surprised with the Taliban. When um, the Taliban had their um, 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 negotiation table uh, with uh, um, the USA, we went embassy to embassy in Afghanistan and asked them, please bring us to the uh, negotiation table with the Taliban. And they didn't want to do it because they scared to put the negotiation process, peace process, under the risk. So it means they knew the Taliban don't believe to women. And I, we wanted to go and be with the Taliban and speak with them face to face and say what our uh, situation and what we want from you. But they, they, all these uh, United States and allies know that the Taliban don't change. They are the same. So they never wanted to face women of Afghanistan with the women of Afghanistan. So, um, I want to say we are a uh, trade in a, I don't name the, the peace process negotiation table because in a peace process, all of the people should be feel that peace. How is kind of peace that we are in cage right now? In that trade table, when the United States monitor it, we trade and they, they sell us to the Taliban. They surround us to Taliban. The only thing that I cannot understand is how it's possible we don't speak about the woman in Afghanistan, not just because I am from Afghanistan. I'm just thinking if I wasn't from Afghanistan, from everywhere, how is possible in this world that in a country that's with the 20, over 20 million women, women is living in a big cage and their homes turn to jail for them. But the world is silent. While uh, had, uh, when they had a problem with Taliban, they came to Afghanistan and they stayed in Afghanistan. They spent millions of dollars in Afghanistan for their aims. They came with the very big slogans and we believed that, human rights, equality. And we give our new generation, our many, many soldiers for these slogans. And that finally they just, you know, changed Taliban with the Taliban. I always say Taliban is a, like a white wolf in the life of women in Afghanistan. Mm. Um, so what hopes looks like for a woman in Afghanistan? They cannot do anything alone. While war covered the protests of women of Iran widely and all of Serbility stay with them and show their solidarity with them, and women in Afghanistan always is like a forgotten story. So we cannot do anything, especially now after 20 years when the United States left a lot of uh, uh, tank and mortar for the Taliban, more than $8 million, $18 million. So we are with, with pen, a person like me with a pen, what, what I can to do, or a woman with, with nothing in Afghanistan while she turned as a prisoner there. We cannot do anything. But I know when the world can find a solution to be friend with the Taliban, what, why we cannot find a solution to be friend with the woman in Afghanistan? Is it really hard? Mm 
and indirectly worked now against support uh, ruling in Afghanistan. Before um, the government of Ashraf Ghani, now the government of Taliban. The world is still support Afghanistan, but now the world indirectly support the terrorist groups. The people who doesn't want to listen to women, the voice of women is a haram for them. It's interesting for me how we can be friends with the terrorist group and we cannot be friends with the women in Afghanistan. There are really many questions that the women in Afghanistan has from the world. And they are raised in any section when they are speaking together. But there are not air for women in Afghanistan. I am not sure that when the world also is there, as a supporter for women of Iran, they was really support the equality, human rights, or just work because they don't like the Mullah government, they stay with the women of Afghanistan, because actually women of Afghanistan totally lost their trust to the uh, United States and the allies. So there is a, 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 a member of the audience who, like you, uh, belongs to the fourth wave of immigrants. And uh, their question is how you handle the survival guilt, especially with what women are going through in Afghanistan? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know I survived while I lost a lot of my friends, especially Lida. She was a very, very close friend. And she told me that she's not okay, but I never thought that maybe with Lida, with a lot of poem and with a lot of ambition for her future can also self-humiliate it. So um, I remember in this time, my brother who also passed the secret gate with me and he is living here in uh, Boston, told me in, that, in, that two, uh, in 1996, uh, seven, six or seven, and he asked me, because I lost all of my close friends, the circle we were four, and he asked me, and asked me, where is your turn? So the people who are waiting, family even waiting for the a self humiliation of me also. But I had this chance to survive. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy. It mm -hmm. wasn't easy. I remember I uh, ran um, a big border in, to Iran when I was four. And when I was 40, again, I ran the secret gate in the Kabul. It wasn't easy to survive. Sometimes I feel shame while I lost all of my friends, how I'm alive and speaking here and there. It's painful for me. Mm. Um, you have written uh, and published six books, six books, as you mentioned, in your mother tongue. And Dancing in the Mosque is the first one that has been translated. What does this international attention mean to you? Uh, it published before the Taliban attack Afghanistan in 2020. Um, and I thought it's open a window for the story of Afghanistan, the real story of Afghanistan, not the story that like a Christina Lamp, a journalist came to Afghanistan for, for 13 or 14 days as a tourist and go to Afghanistan. And after 14 days, um, they return to their home and drink their coffee and start to writing about Afghanistan. You cannot find the sense. But it's the only source that we have about those days I accepted. We didn't write, and it's our fault. But uh, I thought, OK, the dancing in the mosque open maybe, maybe close a window in Afghanistan life for me because it put me in danger. Even one of my brother had a problem with me with this title. Um, but I thought it's open a new window for women's story to the world. And because of that, I started to write Rokhshane stories and show the struggle of women, a struggle of women for fighting for their right in their village event. But 2021 happened. Mm -hmm. And we had a big press conference here by Joe Biden, who told to the people that the people of Afghanistan did not fight for themselves. With this sentence, they closed this open window for me. And nobody wants to read the story of Afghanistan. And political situation has impact on the literature right now. 
it's very hard when my agent speak about the finding a new contract for the tell me everything. It's not about the book, it's about the Afghanistan. Who wanted to read the story, especially after all of this political problem? Mm. And when the world has just one side of the story and they, are, don't, they don't try to know the whole story. So I'm thinking that really, I am the person here to want to speak and write about the Afghanistan, and, but I'm not sure who wanted to read me. Mm. I think I am the, left, the last soldier in the battlefield. Mm. It gives me very pain sometimes that I think I cannot find my route. And I uprooted from the others there, but I cannot find my route here. It's a sense, a deep, profound sense of the confusion, exactly like Rokhshane. Um, it is a kind of personal question. What are some of the hopes and dreams that you have for you and your son at this point? I told you I feel regret or something, feel guilty when I'm speaking about my ambition while I lost my best friends during this all wars time. It's not even one day that the face of Lida, the girls, my friends, came, does, don't come to my mind when I'm speaking or even sometimes when I'm eating. So um, even sometimes I'm not brave enough to speak or even think about my ambitions. But the only thing that makes me happy is, I think I'm not sure because we are from Afghanistan. It's still, when I wanted to go to the last festival literature to France, um, I had to take, a, I didn't know, I had to take a, a um, flight from the Dublin to France, with one stop from here, Dublin and France. And when he saw my identity, the woman, I didn't get visa for Dublin, I didn't know. I had just, it, I wanted to use as a transit. Uh, and she told me, you are from Afghanistan, you need, you need a visa. You know, and he showed, the, many times she showed me the name of Afghanistan, my passport, and my son is scared there. The only thing that I want right now is for my son. I want to bring an end for him. I don't want to, he continue this, you know, suffering and suffering. But for me, I don't know, I lost my homes, I lost my friends, I love that country, and I love all of that country, but I leave all of them. I feel lonely badly lonely, so I don't speak about myself right now, but for my son, I hope to bring an end for him. Thank you, Amira. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.